Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank everyone who worked so hard to help with the funeral this past Friday. It was a beautiful experience, well attended even by young people. That was Clarence Martin's funeral. And I want to thank everyone who worked so hard yesterday for our fall festival, giving our children a wonderful time together. On the back of your bulletin, I uh, want to just give you an update. Betty is today completing half of her kind of missions trip in Thailand and had a very good first week that was mostly in Laos and then flying around with other persons for meetings. And, and from now until this coming Friday, she will be in Chiang Mai, Thailand. That's really a, a beautiful city in northern Thailand. Um, under dates to remember, the board is deciding that on Sunday, November 20th, this is our favorite thing, after church, we'll have a, we'll have a fellowship meal immediately following a fall forum that, that discusses the budget and, and votes on uh, personnel throughout the church and, on, and any other ministry things. But I honestly think the most, one of the, most, the best things we can do as a church is to have a fellowship meal after church, particularly when your wife is traveling. <laughs> I cooked for my son Michael last night. That was pitiful. But pierogies are pierogies, even if they're like rubber. Okay, back on track. Um, God is good. God is working good stuff in our lives, in our hearts, and in our church. We'll quiet our hearts for the prelude at this time. Each other. 
We gather because we love you, and our goal is to fill your heart with our love this morning, and that our lives will be truly pleasing to you. We so invite you to be a part of all that we say and do in these few precious moments we gather in your name. Amen. We will rise for our first hymn, Blessed Assurance, number 416. Mayor this town is speaking 
And we're giving him a generous amount of time. We want to know about the community, about the Declaration House, and about other ministries, and what is going on. Rod, we warmly welcome you to share your heart with us today. And if you run out of things to say, well then, you may sit down. That's an inside joke. That's, uh, yeah, that's always been an inside joke with everyone I know. That seems to be the going thing, is that uh, I don't want to run out of things. That's the problem. So I, I appreciate giving me an hour here this morning. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Uh, no, Pastor Steve, thank you. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. It's been so long since I've been here to share an update with you. You've been some remodeling. Yeah. It's just beautiful, beautiful uh, in this uh, in this text. I, I just uh, am blown away to see all the generosity in our community. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know who Real Life is, if you don't, uh, we actually have information in the back there, just this little booklet that you can kind of peruse through, gives you a better understanding of, uh, of who we are and what we've been able to, to do over these last few years. I'm just impressed uh, for the, the last, I don't know if it's the last time I was here, but uh, you know, the times I'm here sharing about the Declaration House and our vision and, and our excitement for uh, the possibilities of what could be and uh, sharing that vision. And it was just amazing how the community just came together uh, to support us in that vision. And I am blessed to say that we were able to open the Declaration House on August 27th of uh, 2019. And I thought that, you know, okay, uh, God's work was done there, right? And felt that, okay, God was just going to, you know, move on and, and, and focus on something else. Uh, but then COVID hit, right? And our mission statement is connecting the community to hope. And you and I know who hope is, right? And uh, amidst all of this shutdowns uh, that we experienced and isolations and things, uh, real life as a social service organization, uh, we uh, were required to stay in an operation. You know, we were essential uh, to help our community. So we didn't stop. Uh, and we didn't let COVID uh, create it in that um, for us uh, to just step back and just hide. Uh, we stepped out and trusting that God was uh, here and that he had something to do through this experience, uh, we were able to see the, the fact that there was going to be food insecurity here. People were out of jobs. They were not able to uh, make ends meet. They were you know, needing food and other things, other resources. Uh, we stepped up and we uh, purchased an old warehouse behind the Declaration House. It was the old book, uh, Royer's, uh, Lukey Royer's Butcher Shop and, uh, in town and uh, more recently was an uh, old warehouse. We bought that building and with, uh, again, generous uh, donations and grants that we received, we were able to transform that old 2,000 square foot building into uh, Warehouse 916, which is our food distribution center uh, for our community. And it has been incredible. We consolidated the locations of our Power Packs project that we were doing, the different churches that we uh, were working with. We consolidated into one facility uh, that we're able to manage and be able to uh, provide more programs. And we uh, started a client choice uh, program, which is a monthly food distribution for families now. So with our Power Packs, which is a weekly food distribution over the, uh, during the school year with families, with children in the Cook School District, every week getting food there, and then the client choice option, uh, we have over 100 families that are taking, uh, participating, taking that opportunity to get food. Last year, uh, we had uh, the opportunity where the building that was attached to the Declaration House uh, the old lawyer house, uh, we were able to uh, purchase that. That came up for sale, and we felt that, you know what, there's going to be a greater need for uh, affordable housing, and we knew that uh, that if, it, if we didn't buy it, it would be purchased by an investor, which is great. If you invest property, that's wonderful, but we need a more affordable housing in our community. So we acquired that building, and it has three uh, apartments there. The third floor was vacant. We are in the process of completing a renovation of that building that uh, will add two more studio apartments, uh, adding two more beds uh, to our uh, now 15 apartments, affordable apartments uh, for our community. And uh, let me tell you, they, um, there's a waiting list. Uh, 
uh, and that's something that uh, we are challenged for, uh, and we'd love to continue to provide that opportunity for those who are experiencing, especially single moms, you know, single dads even, that uh, just don't have the ability to make ends meet, uh, giving them a, an affordable apartment that uh, they can uh, live in, that can make a, a home for them and their children has been incredible. Uh, and we uh, continue to build relationships with those folks that, that, that are staying in our homes. It's been a great uh, asset here uh, for our community, as well as our transitional home, or what we call the Glory House, uh, which is a, a, a two-bedroom uh, apartment that we have available for moms uh, coming out of homelessness, giving them on an extra year of care uh, with a social worker, a mentor to help them get back on their feet and thrive. Uh, we've had a couple moms actually transition through uh, the Glory House into the Declaration House, which has been incredible uh, for them, and to see that, uh, that they have hope in their lives and connecting with them and building relationships with them. And uh, they, you know, two moms that actually came through, they both go to church. One goes to my church at Double Westgate Church in Ephrata. Uh, that has been a great asset for them. We started two new programs this year. Again, COVID didn't stop us. We are we're continuing to move on. We're continuing to expand. We're continuing to see opportunities where we can make a difference in our community. We started Young at Heart, which is a senior center program uh, that meets at Adamstown Elementary School. I'm uh, not elementary. Sorry, Adamstown Library, where the uh, uh, seniors every first and third Wednesday morning uh, from nine until eleven. They get together, uh, they have fun activities, they have a craft every time they get together. Uh, they listen to all these music, you know, how many all these music lovers, you know, they just, it's a lot of fun and just, you know, and, and they talk, tell, share stories, uh, they play games, car games, you know, who knows, been really popular, but they just really love to connect with one another. And, and after COVID, this is something that was seriously needed uh, for them just to uh, rebuild and reconnect uh, with others. And uh, we also have usually have someone from the community come, a resource come and share. Uh, it's uh, about uh, resources at the library, uh, the police department share about different resources that they offer. Uh, seniors they actually have a, a, a way that they can uh, have a, a GPS uh, that, uh, that they can provide for seniors who are dealing with dementia or something like that, that family and loved ones can stay uh, connected and make sure that they're safe. Uh, so different things like that, um, you know, Medicare uh, programs and, and things like that, how to navigate those things. These are things that seniors really are interested in and, and really value. So we're able to give them more information and help through that. Thinking Thursdays, uh, we also started every Thursday night at the Lighthouse Community Center uh, there in Denver, right across the street from the Declaration House. That has been a, a nice asset for our community. We open it up for different times, different topics that we come uh, together and talk about and experience. Uh, different topics like how to cook casseroles, which was very popular in Westlake. You might want to try that one out. See, all right. Yeah, um, parenting, uh, parenting your toddlers. Uh, you know, you know, trauma informed care. How to care for yourself and your emotional well being. Uh, gardening. Crafts such as uh, macrame. I don't even know what macrame is, but <laughs> it, macrame is uh, it was a popular one. We had 15 people just come out to learn more about macrame and uh, pottery. We had the pottery experience, uh, which was great, and uh, oil painting, and we also have uh, bingo from time to time. So each week is different. We have a, uh, a, a Facebook group that we post on our online that people follow and learn what's coming up next so they're able to connect there uh, which was a lot of fun <laughs> this summer we did see some staff transition uh, Chris Everett some of you know well uh, our social worker and she has stepped down and moved on and we hired uh, Kathy Scott as the interim uh, social worker and Kathy has been incredible she has been uh, amazing <laughs> working with uh, our clients and and, and those who are in need to make them feel comfortable and make them uh, feel that, that we do care uh, as a community and helping them get back on their feet uh, has been great. Uh, we are looking for, have been uh, looking for a new social worker for long term. Uh, if anyone knows a social worker that might be interested, uh, come see me or just give us a call. Uh, we wouldn't mind. We don't have anyone set yet, uh, but we have some, uh, some direction there. So that would be a great asset for us. 
Uh, these past two months, uh, however, I must say, have been uh, very um, difficult, uh, seeing the number of people coming to us who were in need of housing. I cannot tell you uh, in the time that I have uh, the number of people that have been walking in off the streets, uh, coming into our office, saying I'm homeless, I have no place to go. Uh, families calling us and saying I'm about to be evicted, uh, I, I don't know what to do, I can't pay the rent. Uh, I can't. Family, one family came to us, they just had their electric turned off, uh, they couldn't pay their electric bill, and uh, they got shut off, and they needed to uh, get the power back on. Uh, again, they had 11 people in the household. I couldn't see 11 people on the street, so we, we paid that electric bill. Uh, but we, every time we meet with someone and give them a, a financial support, we say you must meet with our social worker, you must help yourself, and give, uh, we give them an action plan on how to, steps to get out of the situation that they're in. And we follow up with them to see how well those action steps are going and make sure that they're on the right path to self-sustainability. It's been a challenge, I must say. The, uh, all the uh, shelter beds in the county are full. Uh, they've been full all summer. Uh, there is not a single bed that's available. If someone came off the street right now, we would not have anywhere to send them. Uh, the only thing we could do is offer a, a motel room. And you know, as well as I do, that's not self-sustaining. That is not uh, what we want at all. Um, so this has been a huge struggle for us. Uh, and, we did, and we divvied out more uh, financial aid and, uh, and paying for rent and hotel stays uh, than we would like. But we know that, it, again, our mission, connecting the community to hope. And that's what we see. Uh, one story I'll end with and, and share with you, a 72-year-old woman, uh, we got a call. Uh, it, was, it was a Friday afternoon. It was a Friday afternoon. Uh, a Friday afternoon. Uh, my wife and I literally were ready to uh, uh, to uh, you know, an hour away from leaving for our, our weekend vacation to the beach. I've been to the beach all year. <laughs> We've been a little busy. Yeah. Um, and uh, we saw this opportunity where uh, we get away an hour before we get this call. 72 year old woman's down here at Red Roof Inn. She's been staying in the parking lot for the last two days. Uh, overnight, in a parking lot. 72 year old woman, and she has a cat. The cat is sick. The woman has nothing. She was staying in Red Roof Inn until her money ran out, and then he kicked her out. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I told my wife, look, we might have to delay a little bit. Uh, and two hours later, uh, you know, we uh, got uh, this woman uh, in uh, a motel. Uh, we worked with our good partners at various social services, and together we were able to get her into a motel. Uh, and we, um, knowing that the cat was sick, we were able to get the, the veterinarian, which is two doors down from the declaration hospital, great relationships, uh, and asked if they would take care of this cat. The cat had a severe uh, uh, urinary tract infection and, uh, and it was really not doing well. They, they took care of the cat and uh, they didn't charge her a dollar. They cared for that cat while the woman was at, at the motel. We were able to you know, get work with the county and, and resources and, and get her into a more stable place. Uh, she's not, and yet she doesn't have a permanent place, a permanent home yet, but she's well on her way. And that um, is what we do. My wife and I did go on a vacation, we were a couple hours late, but we enjoyed our weekend uh, knowing that this woman was safe. This is what we do uh, day in and day out at Real Life Community Services. We do everything we can to connect our community to hope through collaborations, partnerships, and purposeful relationships. Um, that's what we do. We appreciate you and your uh, church here supporting us and uh, working with us. It's been incredible. We're not done yet. We have a lot of good things. We have our Momentum Club that's still going, uh, you know, started up again after COVID, our youth development programs. Uh, for middle school, we have mentors now 
uh, that mentor high school students who in turn mentor middle school students. Uh, so that has been a lot of, uh, of fun uh, with our new uh, team there and uh, at the Lighthouse has been great. Uh, there's so many more things I would love to share, uh, but I know you have a message. I know Pastor Steve would like to share, uh, but I'll be sticking around after the service. Again, uh, come by, see me, uh, talk to me more. Grab this book. It talks more about how you can help out, how you can volunteer. Uh, maybe you have a, uh, an interesting um, hobby that you like to share on Thinking Thursdays. Maybe you like to teach Pastor Steve how to cook uh, with, uh, using a crock pot or something like that. That would be great. Uh, come see us. We would love to hear more from you. And just stay here a moment. I want to give you all the time if you have any questions. And I'm going to start off with one. Wow, thank you. You, you mentioned three facilities. The Declaration House, the Warehouse, and the House Next Door. Um, how are you doing on finances? The great debt reduction. The Declaration House was over four million, wasn't it? Uh, three and a half. Three, three, three and a half million. Uh, we we raised three million of that three and a half million, and we had a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Uh, that mortgage, that reduction is happening, and uh, we know it's taken 20 years to uh, to pay that mortgage off. But the Declaration House, uh, the way it's structured with the 10 apartments that are there, the affordable apartments, uh, and with our businesses there, the uh, grocery store. How many guys have been to Willow Creek Grocery in Denver? That is the best. I love that store. Uh, they, they have a deli in there. They make uh, fresh meats, fresh subs. It is is great asset to our downtown community for sure. Uh, so please check that out. And also Union Community Care, which is the, the dentist office there uh, that is affordable. If you have Medicaid, Medicare, uh, and you want to see a dentist, they take Medicaid, Medicare. They do take uh, cash as well as other insurances. They're a huge asset for our community as well. They each pay rent uh, to that uh, to that building. So the Declaration House is self-sustaining, if you could, if I could say that. The rents that come in pay for the mortgage and the costs that are there to operate that building, which has been great. Uh, the other uh, buildings, the warehouse, uh, the lighthouse uh, is another one that uh, the, the community center. That's a youth center program. We have alcohol Anonymous that meet in there picking Thursdays. We have Women's Aglow. I don't know if I've ever heard of Women's Aglow. A women's ministry, if you've ever come there, uh, every, uh, I think it's third, third Saturday mornings there. We have Wednesday morning uh, Bible study for uh, the uh, high school students uh, before school. They come out and, and, and have a worship time there together. And there's so many things, activities going on. As I mentioned, the Glory House uh, that operates a, 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 a transitional home for moms coming out of homelessness. Uh, and our, our Warrior House, again, which is more affordable housing. It's been incredible. Um, you know, it all goes, it takes money, right? It takes money to operate and staff to, to run it. And it's been incredible to see uh, our staff step up and, uh, and in this community helping, supporting uh, that ministry, those ministries. Uh, with the increased benevolence that we're, we're giving out, we, that is not sustaining, I'll tell you right now. If we're continuing that, we're going to run out of money. Uh, we need, uh, you know, more assistance there, more help from our community to continue to help these folks. I, I do not want to be that guy who's going to say, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't help you. Mm -hmm. There's just, we, we know, and it's case by case, there are some, that are very few, that we said, look, we cannot financially help you because uh, you're, there's not financially sustainable. You know, and those are tough conversations. It's very few. Uh, we're able to help most folks, most families and individuals who are coming to us and direct them to other op organizations and programs as well. But we are continuing to uh, serve our community and serve well and helping so many people and help them understand that they are loved and cared for. Is the basement space of the declaration house, is that been yeah, so, so, developed? So yeah, it has actually. We, <laughs> we didn't know what we didn't know. When we built the declaration house, we had this, the, the basement. Uh, half the basement was for the tenants. We put in a, um, a, a point-operated laundry and storage space for the tenants, which is really uh, helpful for them. So they have extra storage there, and they can use the laundry there, uh, which is great. And the other half was open space. Uh, we took uh, about a, a third of that space, and we built more offices because we had more staff. <laughs> and I didn't know. I, I just I, I knew that uh, God had a plan. I just didn't know how big he wanted it. <laughs> And so we have some extra space there that we still use for storage um, and still can add a couple more offices in there. Um, again, we're, we're trusting the Holy Spirit here and trusting that God will direct us uh, to where he needs us to be. We just didn't know what a need 
was in our community and so we start, until we started helping. Once we started helping, once the word got out and we started being, you know, referred to, and I encourage anyone in this church, and you, you probably get the calls to, you know, the, the, those who are in need, if, uh, if you have someone in need, give us a call. Get them, have them call us, get them set up with uh, an appointment with our social worker so that they can help them get action steps to get them Amen. back out of poverty, back into a place where they can care for themselves. And that's what community is all about. That's what we're here to do. Any questions? That's a lot of information. And you say, I talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> I learned I have to. Because <laughs> a lot of information is yeah, the first time. Yes. I just yes. want to thank you so much for your vision of Denver and our community. That you said the little grocery store. I always thought, you know, every town needs a little grocery yeah. store. And the lawyers left. And it's just wonderful having that there. And we're blessed, and I, I must say, you know, I give all the honor and glory to God, and I'm just a humble servant willing to obey, and it's just incredible to see what he's doing. It and really to, is. And to take that place where, like, a lot of drug use was. Right? Yeah, that, that, yeah. And converted. And, and you heard the story, most of you heard the story, you know, when we were praying as, uh, every Tuesday morning, I could gather pastors and pray, and when we were praying, uh, back in 2014, I'll never forget the day, and we were praying for uh, transformation in our community and praying for the darkest place in our community. If God can transform that place, He can transform the entire community. And that dark place was the Denver House. And how about that? What an amazing transformation. Not only that property, but look what's happening in downtown Denver. Look at Unruh Insurance coming in and investing money and rebuilding the, the old Fulton Bank. Uh, that has been an incredible asset. Uh, it, Castaneda's Mexican restaurant. Like, seriously, like, who would have thought there would be something as good as that would be coming into town? And their old building they had to move out of, uh, that has become the worst flooded building. That's going to be taken down and be rebuilt here the next year. Uh, that is going to uh, be beautiful again, asset to our community. Uh, folks are fixing up their facades, they're cleaning things up. It's just been incredible. Uh, Courtyard Cafe has done incredible things there with their. Uh, cafe as well, and just making our beautiful downtown. And so we see this, we see the transformation happening. It's all because of what God has given uh, to us, the vision and the direction where he wants to take our community. And we thank you as a church for uh, being a part of that. It, it, it's just awesome. And I'd love to be a part, I'd love to share the stories. I'd love to come and see you all uh, again. Please invite me back much sooner next time, Steve, okay, please? I love that. Thank you. I appreciate it. And that's our mayor. Let's share our applause. <clears throat> I think we've got new hope for politics after seeing Rodney. <laughs> we'll come to our time of sharing our joys and concerns. I did want to mention. Uh, Real Life Ministries is one of our main outreaches. It is local, it is changing lives, and I read online that this fall, instead of putting on a big banquet, you're gonna use Extraordinary Give, correct? Yes, please. And I appreciate it, it doesn't even pitch a commercial. So what we give as a congregation, and if you wanna give personally, and bring people off the streets and out, out of living in cars, that has value. And uh, I wouldn't waste your time and bring a lot of folks in here because it's a different program. But what Real Life is doing, you can see downtown Denver brightening and the homes, buildings fixing up. And, and that's, that's a miracle to turn around, frankly, what's called life. So I thank God. Prayer concerns, I want to give you some updates. Remember Reedy? Uh, she's coming along. That knee is very sore. And uh, so please, remember her, visit her. Remember Jerry Merklinger. He too had foot surgery. Had a daughter come down from New England, staying with him a while. Uh, be aware. Um, he has a new address and a new phone number. I'm not sure it's in our directory. I'm not sure we gave it to you, Rachel. Okay, good. Very important. Okay, yes. We need and maybe get it back in the bulletin uh, because of the cell phone. Finally tomorrow, Doris is having her knee replacement. And like all of us, it's funny, when the pain gets bad enough, you're ready to go. <laughs> Unfortunately, her sister Dolores fell backward and hit her dresser today, 
hopefully she's okay. She had the arm, the shoulder fractured during a surgery and is having a slow recovery from that. Uh, I want to mention, it's been on the prayer chain, a, a, a young woman, 35 years old, a friend, uh, a friend of the family of the church. Uh, she was traveling, and, and the short of it is, uh, she's having lung failure, it's filled with mucus, she's in a coma in a hospital in Germany. She's only 35 and was healthy. Her name's Shannon White, and uh, she's Kim Porter's adult daughter's best friend. Shannon, these are very, very serious, and uh, well, day by day, we see the whole situation, Russia, Ukraine, just escalating. I know when my son was, I said, a friend of mine, when my son was trained as a correction officer, they trained him seven weeks in de-escalation. When you can do how you can stand and talk, and he's done it in restaurants, when people lose, when the situation is out of control, how with guidance, things can back control. And I think that's what Jesus does. Our world needs some de-escalation, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes, yeah, I won't go further than that. Okay, uh, prayer concerns, joys from you. Well, then I know we have unspoken ones to share. We're going to turn now to our prayer song and sing it twice. An old one, His Name is Wonderful, number 173.
But we also pause and each of us lifts to you one specific situation that we cannot mention in public, but we carry in our hearts and we take a moment of silence. <clears throat> Thank you, dear God in heaven, for hearing us. It's the reason we're here because you still change lives and make new beginnings. All of these things we lift to you with joy and gratitude for who you are and the great work of salvation you are doing among us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I do ask you now to join me in turning to Revelation chapter 2. As we look at this morning, the church called Ephesus. <coughs> it's a joy for me because I've never preached on this text or topic in my entire life. The church at Ephesus. You see the citation for your brown pew Bible, and I'm going to start reading now. So there's John on this lonely island with the worst of Roman criminals, and he's worshiping on a Sunday morning. He hears a loud, pounding voice behind him, <clears throat> and then an angel speaks to him. First one. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But this you have in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We know that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, and this is the revealing of the totality of Jesus Christ as Lord of all. This is the same disciple to whom Jesus committed to care for his own mother as Jesus was dying on the cross. Early church history clearly tells us that later, John went to the church at Ephesus and became a pastor there for time. And we know from history that the Lord richly blessed John's ministry there. Tradition says some were even raised from the dead by John's prayers. And if you look in the book of Acts and throughout early church history, this happened from time to time. Thirty years after the death of Jesus, the emperor heard about this church at Ephesus and the deeds of John. And the emperor Domitian was angry and had John arrested and taken to Jerusalem. And tradition says, and I want to stop here and say, there is tradition 
I'm sorry, there is history, there is tradition, and then there's stories and so on. There is a continuum. We know historically, John was brought to Jerusalem and abused publicly. Tradition says they threw him into a pot of hot oil and he did not die. Uh, we know that something very terrible happened, as still happens today, and humans survive it. And by the way, John was 90 years old when they brought him back to Jerusalem and abused him for a thriving ministry at Ephesus. We know there was some kind of miraculous intervention, and if all of our hearts were really open to God, there have been miraculous interventions in our lives. Anyway. <laughs> Not knowing what to do with this old man now, they tried to kill him once. They banished him to a, a despicable Greek island where they put criminals they couldn't stand. It was called Patmos. So John's sitting in this disgusting place, worshiping God on a Sunday like this. After all of this, God wasn't done with John. Boy, what does it say to you and me today for people who go on and on in years? And, and Doug and I and many of you would marvel at the things Clarence Martin said at age 91. So God sends a messenger to give a message to John about his pastorate back at Ephesus. The name Ephesus means desired one or beautiful place. And so it was. Ephesus was a center for land and sea trade. It was located on the beautiful Castor River and had this amazing harbor that provided safety for the ships. It was called the Light of Asia. Ephesus was also called the Marketplace of Asia. To enter the city from the harbor after you got off your boat or off the road, and this was all by design, you would travel on a beautiful marble road that was only a half mile long and 35 feet wide to impress you as you entered the main city. Ephesus at that time had the great temple of Diana, also known as Artemis. This temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world at that time. Along the front were 120 columns, each was 60 feet high. And I pause here and remind us, uh, we are not living in older Europe, uh, that we don't see this kind of architectural beauty much in our lives at all. Not like this. 36 of those 120 columns were inlaid with beautiful gems. It was a stunning building. And on top of all this, by law, that temple, and it was a massive temple, was a legal refuge for people, and get this, even criminals. Everyone inside that building was free from any of the local laws. It became so full, the temple, that the law expanded to the entire city of Ephesus. I'm not saying it was lawless, but boy, did it get funky. The temple was the site of some of the grossest immorality of the ancient world. They did many, their worship, their order of worship included public acts of sexual immorality, and get this, and human self-mutilation, cutting and injuring your own body in worship. The local philosophers called what happened in that temple a grotesque experience, and that was the non-Christian uh, people. The main injury and the main industry of Ephesus was the manufacture of the statues of this glorious Diana. Remember a little before in Acts chapter 19, Paul came to the, to the city of Ephesus and preached Christ without any excuses. And the people responded to his preaching and gave their hearts to the Lord. So much so 
that the sales of the statues of Diana severely dropped off. And what happened? There was a public riot throughout Ephesus. People were losing money. And you remember the story, thank God. A very capable city clerk who was well-connected got the town together and quieted the riot, and Paul left for Macedonia. Remember, Paul had spent three years of his life building the church there. And I want to say, it was more than one church, because it, it, it numbered in the thousands. Some, I, I read some estimates, 30,000, I don't know. I would think in the thousands. Then Timothy was in charge of a multiple church families in Ephesus as well. So you have Paul, you have Timothy, you have John. By the way, there's so much happening there in the life of the church that the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, also had moved there and died within, within the ministry of the Christian church there. Beyond all of this, you had the great Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila, all ministered in this group of profound churches. Remember, this, these were a strong church. Lives were being changed. And God says wonderful things through the angel. He says, you have hard workers for Christ. They invested themselves, I say like Ron Red Tate, all in for Christ. You know, someone said to come to Christ, to think of Christ, costs us nothing. To serve Christ costs us something. So, they committed themselves to do hard personal work. They also held to some moral absolutes. They went, they went into church and would identify those who kept, who kept creeping in, who were evil among the church. Always making trouble. They would bring the evil of the world into the church, and the church would have to face it and stop it and send them away. And as you know, and as Ron alluded to, helping people, helping ourselves, and facing issues is never comfortable. And it always is messy. Finally, the angel says, and, and on top of all this, they held to a sound doctrine, a sound core of what it means to follow Jesus. Some came to the churches, it says, and said, well, I'm an apostle. An apostle means sent by Jesus to change the world. And Ephesus, the leadership there examined them, their teaching, their relationships, and their goals, and told them, you're not an apostle at all. And, and, and you know how we know? By your fruits and by the spirit of controversy you're stirring up in the churches. They also held their new teachers to doctrinal standards. They didn't say, well, if you have energy and if you smile a lot and if you're good to our people, you can teach what you want. We said, no, there is a line. There is truth and there is error. And it said they tested these new teachers through their ministry. And tradition says they dismissed as many as necessary. Back in Acts chapter 20, Paul had warned them before he had to get out of town. Paul says, and this says in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31, Paul says, quote, I know after I leave now, persons will arise in your church and distort the truth. In order to draw away your best disciples and have them follow them as people, not God. They want a following rather than teaching how to follow Christ. And Paul says, be on your guard. Remember how for three years I, Paul, never stopped warning you of being a church in this city, in culture. And he said, night and day, with tears, I told you how to discern false teachers. Boy, in Ephesus, like today, it's so popular to say, I'm tolerant, I'm open-minded, I think I can accept most anything. 
And, I, and you know, there are many new things in our culture today, just like theirs. Matter of fact, it's kind of believed that as our culture is changing <coughs> since the 70s, we have moved into what's called a post-Christian culture. It's a little hard to feel that in Lancaster County <laughs> when there's a church in every block. And there are plain communities that have drawn hard lines and held to them much more than other cultures. But we are living in our own Ephesus as well. They were a strong church. They worked hard for Christ. They held the moral absolutes. They drew lines, gracious lines, in their lifestyles. They held, they held the sound doctrine. They drew, they drew gracious lines about who and what would be taught. And finally, it says, they endured hardships with perseverance. Remember, a church doing the right thing for Jesus will always get pushback and criticism. Now, there's one challenge the church gets. Through all of this struggle and hard work, they lost their first love as church people. You know today, 20% of the church have to do everything in the local church. It becomes too much with too little thank yous. And we're human. And when that happens in the local church, resentments build. And they should, because we still are human. We can be so busy doing the work of the church that we forget why we are the church. And this is his challenge to this wonderful group of churches throughout Ephesus. It is possible to do everything right for Jesus tomorrow and still be wrong because we did it in the wrong spirit. Because we're not doing it in the love of Jesus. In my first, in my first church, <laughs> that was in 85, I dreaded that, <laughs> I'm pressing 40 years. Um, uh, in my first church, we built a building, as you always get into the facilities, and then money tightened up. And um, in the church, we had a professional baker. That he always says, there's cooking, there's baking, there's candy making. And each one is increasingly hard. I said, Betty, don't worry, I'm not going to try. Anyway, but she reminds me that how, how much um, candy making can be and the results. So our church said, now we're going to make the highest quality Easter eggs you can make. We sold more every year. Then we bought a commercial mixer and advertised that not only the best quality, but oh, Dennis, they were the creamiest. Uh, uh, commercial kitchen aid. They, the butter and stuff, and creamiest, and sweet, semi-sweet, and then something else. I don't know what it was. We sold more every year. And we became the Easter egg, Church of the Brethren, and, and raised some money. <coughs> Years passed. <coughs> We all got tired of making Easter eggs. Oh, man. It became a sore spot, and then we depended on the Easter egg money instead of the biblical challenge for everyone to step up and give God a generous offering. And um, so in time, we had to stop the Easter eggs because we started out as a gift, blessing, and dream in a community. Uh, it's called, in, in, in management, it's called mission drift. We drifted off our mission and came back. I'm going to give you an example of losing our first love. It is the ultimate temptation for every one of us in most areas of our life. Some years ago, a newlywed couple were walking down the street. She almost tripped, and her husband touched her arm and said, Be careful, sweetie. Ten years later, they were walking down that same street, and she almost tripped on the same spot. And her husband growled, why don't you pick up your feet? <laughs> that is losing our first love. He still loved her. But the attitudes can change. 
because we're overwhelmed with so much that we become hard <laughs> on our first loves. Our family, our spouses, our Lord, our church. This past Tuesday evening, our guest speaker was Joanne Hershey, and I said she amazed me. She came, she came thoughtfully prepared. And I love it when a speaker has something to say instead of working like a leaf blower, just blowing hot air. She was our first moderator for five years by design and drove all the way from up at Florin every day just for years to guide our church. She said, every Sunday we come to church and we are challenged at the Florin church to fall in love with Jesus all over again. And we are taught to understand that and to expect that as an act of worship so we don't lose our first love. When I first started ministering, um, I wanted something on the bulletin every Sunday. And I agonized over that and prayed a long time and borrowed it from the Providence Church of Brothers on top of our bulletin now. Every Sunday I come here for the love of Jesus filling every heart. You know, and others have, our church exists to stop sin in your life every day. And that, that's a reason. <laughs> but uh, I think it has to be more winsome and positive. You can stop sin and not care about Jesus. You can do that because you're guilty in. Him. And this is positive. We live for the love of Jesus filling every heart. Every Sunday, and this is as true for me as everyone else, I must be careful to come and focus on the main thing, loving Jesus, loving others, and letting a truckload of stuff go so I can face Monday on a new footing. This is our mission today, to fall in love with Jesus all over again. And may we do that tomorrow, and every day for the rest of our lives. And I remember that teacher in one of the Bible studies video games. He said, to the extent that as the years go by, you will be walking with Jesus and fulfilled and content in Him to the point that you won't even realize you died. You'll be in heaven and say, oh my goodness, two weeks ago I died. But I was walking with and enjoying Jesus and my local church. And I, and I didn't realize I left them behind. I'm here with my eternal family now. Our closing hymn is a prayer. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Number 475, will you rise with me?
deeper in love with you. And then may you give us the energy and vision to live our days in a way that just fills your heart and brings you glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.